folks, to episode 3,465 of the Survival Podcast. It is Wednesday. That means it's interview day, and we have one of my favorite types of interviews. Instead of somebody that has a supplements line or something they want to promote, we have just regular old community members here who are living the dream, living the lifestyle full on. Uh, a long time ago, I did an episode that was really, really popular about homesteading as a retirement plan. What if you were really young when you decided that's the way it was going to be already? Uh, Ryan and Amelia, Susie, will be on with us in just a minute. And they're going to talk about that. They started this journey like way earlier than even they had planned. And they're on track to where, you know, you might be looking at a retirement somewhere around 40 years of age with a homestead providing for your needs and all off grid. And we're calling today's show taking the plunge and building off grid, because at some point, if you're going to do something like this, you just got to do it. And that's true in so many walks of life. I hear people say, I'm going to move to the country. Well, then you just got to do it. I'm going to move to another state. You just got to do it. Uh, I'm going to start a business and you just got to do it at some point. You have to pull the pin and throw the grenade and take cover and see what happens. And if you don't, it's just intellectual masturbation. We do not deal in that here at TSP. So we will have Ryan and Amelia on in just a moment. Before we do, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors of the day. Sponsor day number one today is JM Bullion. Now, yesterday I yelled at you guys really for a long time about Bitcoin and how it is the best investment that there is today. And I do believe that. And uh, I do dunk on Peter Schiff once in a while and all, but I, I am not a hater of precious metals. I stack sats and I stack silver and I stack some gold. And when I'm going to pick up silver or gold, I do it from JM Bullion. And I'll tell you why. I can buy from them for less than local shops down the street. Uh, they ship all the orders for free. They give me a discount, and you can get one, too, if you're an MSB member. And they got better pricing than, like, Monix and Atmix and all of them. And they've been sponsoring me for a decade. So I don't know why or anybody in this audience would go anywhere else for their silver and gold stacking needs. Um, but I'll tell you the biggest thing. The owner of this company is a guy named Michael. I don't want to give away his last names. Usually guys that run companies this size don't want that publicly known. Um, but I can directly contact him by email if there's ever a problem. I was approached by Lear Capital not long before I, I, I started working with JM. And I asked them for somebody, you know, it didn't have to be the owner, but like someone at, at really a command level that could just fix the thing instantly, whether policy said so or not. And guess what? They told me no. And I told them no. JM Bullion came along soon after. They have been my partner in this space ever since. And I will not go with anybody else. And I don't recommend that you do so either. Next up today, you know, when you're talking about silver and gold, you're talking about building your wealth. And the way to build your wealth is to grow your wealth over time. You grow your wealth like you grow your garden. And you can learn all about that at the Wealth Studying Podcast with John Pugliano. You really want to check out John. John is one of us, guys. He's not just some dude that decided one day he wanted to advertise on my show. John is a prepper. He's a ham radio operator, and he is an excellent investment manager. Uh, he came up to me in uh, Salt Lake City back in 2010 and told me he was about to launch his investment management firm, and he knew how I felt about financial liars, but he was going to do it the right way. And you know when you first meet someone, you're not sure, but I'm a pretty good judge of a man, and I'm, I thought, you know, this guy seems solid. We've been working together ever since. Guys, that's 14 years. You know you can trust John because I can trust John. His podcast is short, direct, and to the point, and the highlights of what you need to know for the week. Check him out again. You will find him at the Wealthsteading Podcast at wealthsteading.com. With that, let's go ahead and bring on our special guests, uh, Amelia and Ryan Susie. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I am excited to do this interview. Like I said, I really like to do interviews with people who are living the lifestyle and just want to tell their story and encourage others to give it a shot. Can we start out with, and I've got two of you, so I'll let you guys work out who talks first and, and what you say, but what is kind of your background prior to all of this? Like go back to like high school or picking a college major or whatever. And what did you do professionally? And, and then how does it lead you to a point where you're like, yeah, I, I've had enough of that. 
Um, well, we, I'm sorry, I guess when we met, I was my senior year of college. I have a degree in Homeland Security and Emergency Management. So basically, I have a degree in why our infrastructure is terrible and really weak, because it's all my classes where we're all the ways in which, you know, everything failed. So that kind of lent really nicely into being a prepper and having not a lot of trust in the system. Um, and throughout college, I worked a bunch of jobs, a lot of farms and different things like that. And I was also an EMT. And then we had met, he was working as a career fireman in a bigger city, you know, for Connecticut. And, uh, he was working 80 to hundred hours a week regularly. And we both just kind of hit a point where we decided like this kind of terrible and not how we would want to raise a family. Mind if I jump in? Huh? Yeah, go. So, uh, like she said, yeah, working long hours as a fireman. I basically lived there. Um, I could have sold the house and just lived at the firehouse, and it wouldn't have been much of a difference. Um, actually, so I was a firefighter and EMT since before the thing that we can't talk about in 2020. I, uh, I was working on an ambulance a lot of the time and was actually threatened with the how do i get this not demonetized for you? uh the jabby jab okay so i was basically told that like you are going to get this or you're going to lose your job now i had actually just started listening to tsp around the time i think the second episode i ever heard was 10 steps to restoring america okay and it really resonated with me a lot of what you had to say and i was like yeah no if i lose my job i have no idea what i'm gonna do mm -hmm. So while I really didn't have it planned out, like that kind of planted the seeds in my head of, all right, I need to be doing something so that if I do lose my job, I'm not totally screwed. Um, so they ended up backing down on the mandates, but it was still like, as eh, something's not right. Like once you start waking up to it, you just can't go back to sleep. So um, we started looking at property in New Hampshire originally but land is very expensive. So um, while she was looking at properties, came across this beautiful 32 acres in Krogan, New York. It's where we live. And um, so we bought the property with the plan of, oh, you know, over a few years, build things up and save. And let's see, it was May of 2023 when we closed on the property. And said, ah, you know what? At first, before we even closed, we were like, ah, we'll buy this, give it a few years, and then move up. And then by the time we closed, we were already talking about like, all right, we're putting the house up for sale. We're going to live in a camper while we build. Like, I'm just done. It's one of those things you get to a point where enough is enough. And once you have that option to do something better, everything kind of becomes pretty intolerable, if that makes sense. So I, I liked being a fireman. I, I really, I loved my coworkers. I liked that I got to help people, but it just, yeah, I don't think it was worth staying there paying, you know, half your income is, you know, for a mortgage versus this, where the land will be paid off by the time I'm 36, okay. you know, depending on what we're doing and what we're producing. Uh, it's going to be enough that it's self-sufficient is the goal. So, sorry, I spoke a lot on that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that was all I got. <laughs> so, Amelia, you were studying Homeland Security, and you kind of alluded to it that they basically told you everything that was messed up and broken in our country in a weak spot. Um, so I can see that making somebody a prepper, but how does it, how does it lead you toward living in the middle of the woods and homesteading? Because a person with that degree would generally be looking for a job in like, you know, Washington, D.C. or Boston or New York City after a completion of it. Honestly, I just it similarly to what he said, where I kind of woke up to a lot of the problems and all the things that were wrong. And I already, I already had like a baseline of distrust in the systems. And then I saw all of that and then, you know, met him was like, all right, well, there's somebody else who feels the same way and we can just go and do this. It stopped being worth it to try to go pursue, you know, a job and probably a three letter agency, which is where most of my classmates went, Sure, you know, trying to realize that all of that's kind of, not worth it 
And I mean, to be fair, having a degree in critical infrastructure protection is really helpful when you're responsible for all of your infrastructure. That that does make sense. Yeah, I don't uh, call the power company when our uh, when our batteries are low. You know, there is trade offs, right? And and yeah, I, I'm not off grid, but like you know, we're on a well. I have my own water system. I have my own septic system. I don't get a bill for it. But when something breaks, you got to fix it or you got to find someone that knows how to work on the thing that you need done. So if when I lived in the suburbs, if I had a plumbing problem, you could, you know, back in the Yellow Pages days, you could have got to the plumbing section and threw a dart at the Yellow Pages and picked the plumber. And you might pick a crappy one, pun not intended, but whichever one you picked would have whatever they needed to work on your property. When you have a problem with a submersible pump that's 180 feet underground and it's got a module in your house that talks to it, there's a lot of plumbers that don't know how to do that. Or, you know, you're on propane and you need somebody with a special plumbing license for propane or whatever, uh, or you have to fix it yourself. And that's something I think a lot of people don't think about when they take this off grid mindset up. It's not so much that it's that big a, a, a hurdle to do it, it's that there is a side of it that is maintenance and, and it's going to fall on you or specialized help. Yeah, we've definitely had that a few times where like we'll have a issue with a couple of our generators. Like it's, you know, negative degrees for a few weeks or, you know, at least a week. And the generators don't want to start. Our batteries are low. It's not sunny enough for our solar panels. And now we're like scrambling, trying to make sure that everything still works. And you know, there's no one to call to fix it. Yeah. Whereas everybody else lost power because of a windstorm and we came home and all of our lights were on. Yeah. yeah. You went to me lose some with that. Go both ways, right? Like I, I learned during the big freeze down here that generators get stored in warm places in the winter time because that's exact. I was at 3 a.m. with the power out when they tried the rolling blackouts and some guy plugged the wrong anything in somewhere and shut down 20 million people's power uh, it, with incompetence. And I'm out there yanking on that cord. And that generator was like, no, boss, I ain't got it. And, and the next day, it was able to be started up. But by then, I had frozen pipes and what have you. Yeah. So, yeah, you yeah. learn lessons like that, don't you? Oh, yeah. Don't worry. If we're incompetent, we won't cause anyone else problems. Yeah. 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 yeah that's the other thing, the though. That, that is the other thing. We don't mess up our neighbors, <laughs> right? So, you guys kind of did the shed to cabin conversion thing, which I think is oh, yeah. really yep. cool. Uh, Bo Brotherington, who's also in our community, has the Shed to House community on Facebook. It's become a, a really big thing for people to do and to think about doing and have like as a future plan. What is yeah. that actually like? And is it a long-term solution? So we went with the Shed to House thing because we originally moved up in a camper that we quickly realized was like half of it was water damage molded. Like we condemned oh, okay. most of it while we were living in it. So we're like, all right, we need something else and we need it quickly. Like this is not sustainable. So a, uh, we live not too far away from a lot of Amish communities and they have like their big shed building companies and they'll deliver them. So we were able to go and pick one that they had pre-made out on the lot and they went and delivered it down, uh, delivered it out to us. And what we had done, actually, this is part where I'm going to have him jump in a bit more for it, with sure. we drove a point for the well before the shed was there, had the shed delivered on top of it and cut a hole in the floor to run a pipe up. Okay. I don't know how familiar you are with driven point wells, like sand point wells. Mm -hmm. So we had one of those in there, and yeah, I'll let you. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, what confidence a minute ago, yeah. I am not a carpenter. Okay. If if I decided I was going to build our house, uh, we would be sleeping outside. No, I'm not that bad. But um, I, I decided, hey, you know what? I was, I'm was i still working since we moved up here. That's one of the nice things, too. She's, uh, she's retired. <laughs> and uh, I, I still work a regular Monday through Friday job right now. And so I was like, hey, by the time winter rolls around, you know, getting what we can done, you know, weekends and evenings, I don't think I'm going to have time to build this well to the point where you know it's going to be something livable that we want to stay in or use long term so 
what we ended up doing, I got to give my uncle Larry credit. Actually, he's like, let's go over to this place. It's uh, like she said, an Amish place, North country storage barns. They make sheds and sell them on the lot. So what we ended up doing is picking one out that we liked, set it right over. And what I had done is driven a point for a well. Um, one of the great things about where we live is, you know, you're probably a quarter of a mile from a river just to the north of us. So I kind of looked at that and went, all right, well, if I drive a point, we should get water. Um, d- did a sand point well down 18 feet okay. and hit water at, I want to say 14 or 15 and went a few extra feet just to be sure. Okay. So I like water the, the house over the well thing because you're yeah. never going to have a freeze up, right? Nope. You could potentially because that last section of pipe isn't insulated. Okay. I didn't know then what I know now. Luckily, knock on wood, we haven't had anything freeze, but it would also be pretty easy to go under there with a blowtorch and thaw it out if I had to. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, so not ideal from the floor of the cabin. It's probably not going to freeze up when I, when yeah, I had my it's well freeze in Arkansas. I didn't freeze under the mobile home. It froze in the well house. Yeah. And we get a little colder here. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing um, about going into like single digits and below zero, it doesn't matter if you don't do it a lot. Uh-huh. I have to do it just once a year and it will break everything. Yeah, That's but, exactly what, when she was talking about the generator not running, yeah. we had one day where it was negative 20. Everything oh. ran fine before that. And that just killed it. Oh, yeah. Works great now, though. No, that's, I don't like living in places where my face hurts. That's, <laughs> <laughs> when the air hurts your face. Of course, there is the counter, like, I'll put up a picture of, like, scorpions in our backyard or something, and. John Dowie, who lives in New Hampshire up near you guys, and he'll say, that's why I live where the air hurts my face. We don't have yeah, that. Right. <laughs> so um, I would imagine in this situation, you know, there's the old saying, you don't want a drill bit, you want a hole. And, and that means that it's not about the thing, it's about what you're trying to accomplish. So in an right. awkward situation in building from the ground up, literally, you have to learn to focus on solutions. So how has that been? Um, it's definitely been a bit of a learning curve. It's easy. You know, you'll have those days where just nothing is working out. Right. And you know, like there was one time where it, we wound up at midnight with the plow truck in a ditch and having to walk two miles in a snowstorm and you just kind of hit a point where like you can sit there and be mad and like have problems coming up to your eyeballs, but you still have to figure out a way to get home and get through it. Yeah, And, there, you know, we come up with, you know, you just kind of come up with solutions to different problems, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. I think a lot of people go into it with this idea of, oh, you know, everything's going to be just perfect. And there are days when that is just not so. You are going to have difficult days. And if you don't have a compelling driving reason for what you're doing. My, my reasoning being, I want to be able to build something better for our future kids and grandkids than I would have been able to had we stayed in the city. Sure. So like that, that's pretty, I mean, I think that's a huge thing is understanding why you're doing it. Cause otherwise first time you hit obstacles and you have a hard time coming up with solutions, you're going to be sitting there going, why the hell am I out here? Yeah. I've never been able to yell at uh, oh, let's say a weed problem in the garden and get the weeds to go away. I've never been able to yell at a piece of bo- wood that I cut too short. And now I got to use another piece of wood. I've never been able to yell at a burnt out power tool. Like you can yell at people and get a result, but like the kind of problems that you deal with when you're homesteading and building things and, and fixing things and trying to get food grown, yelling at the problem doesn't help. Crying doesn't help. Like, being depressed doesn't help being excited. Knowing that you can fix it doesn't. You actually have to like, Do figure out what needs to be done and then focus on what most needs to be done first. Like when you guys got stuck, what most needed to be done is get back to shelter, right? The, the yep. truck will fend for itself. It'll be there when the snow melts, yeah. but you got to get home. 
Yeah. It's like, all right, no, we have a friend that can get the truck out. We're going to leave this till morning time. Yep. But yeah, no, we, now we're hiking back two miles in the snow. <laughs> it it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It always Absolutely. can be. It could have been I, colder. It could have been, instead of snowing, it could have been sleeting. Right. Oh, or, yeah. Freeze. That's that's the other thing I don't miss about the Northeast is standing in a deer stand and like freezing rain, just <laughs> literally freezing to one side of your face. Uh, and the other side is cold, but it actually feels warm in comparison. <laughs> Um, yep. You have a, a a statement on your guest app here that I really like about earning creature comforts like a hot shower. Yes. I want you guys to talk about that because I like that. I, I, what I've called it is the reverse toolbox fallacy. So the toolbox <laughs> fallacy, yeah, you guys are listeners, so you probably know it's where I want to do this thing, but I don't have this other thing, so I can't do the thing until I have the thing. And I was like, how can we problem is the solution that permaculture it where – for instance, like what I did to myself when I started training with a heavy bag, I'm like, I want a better heavy bag. Well, like if you train 30 days consecutively when you're, cause I don't seven days a week, but 30 days of training the way you said you would, then you get to buy that next heavy yeah. bag. Earn right? it. Or, you know, you, you say this, will, this tool will help you. So go build the damn thing without it. And then you get to, you did something. So now you can buy the tool. Is that kind of what y'all were doing? So sort of. So when we started at on the our well at first, we had a hand pump, so a like a pitcher pump, you know, little house on the prairie style. And so originally we were filling like seven gallon jugs. And when we first moved up, our shower was putting a seven gallon jug on top of the toolbox of my truck because that was the only high point to uh you know to stand under to shower. Okay. So we did that for a couple months. And then eventually we got to the point where we had the shed, which we designed it so the shower was in a corner where the uh, right underneath the loft. So we could still put another jug up and at least be inside to shower before we even eventually put an electric pump in. And then after a hot water heater, so it was about five or six months before we could take a hot shower at home. You learn to really appreciate being able to just crack open a valve and hot water comes out. When you, you have to fill seven gallon jugs by hand with a pitcher pump, close it up, set that at a high point and crack it open to take a cold shower. You do that for a few months and you're like, ah, oh, this is so nice. I will never take it for granted again. When I turn the faucet on, you know, when I was in the military, we were in the field one time and we had to take ice cold showers. I mean, it was just that or, or stink. And there's a certain point where you're going to take a shower because if you don't, certain things start not being good anymore. Not You don't just smell bad. You start having issues. And I yeah. remember our commander telling us, you know, man, one day you'll be done with all this. You'll be living the good civilian life. And every once in a while, you're going to take a cold shower just to remind you how much you I have never found it necessary. I still remember. <laughs> I still like, remember. Nope. What it's like to take a cold shower. And I swear to God that every time I get into a steaming hot shower, I think about what it was like to step into ice cold water and just go as fast as you can and just be literally shivering while you're putting your clothes on and trying to get your core temperature back up. And I, I have a feeling unless something breaks, you're probably not going to do it just for the hell of it ever again. Oh, well, no. <laughs> well, we use a... We use a small tankless propane heater, okay. so you'll be in the middle of taking a nice warm shower, and occasionally oh, no. you get a cold spot. No, oh, no. So you, yeah. you get that reminder sometimes. You check the oh. tank before you turn it on, like, you know. Yep. Because um, that, too. I, I, I keep telling him when my grandson stays here, I'm going to. I'm going to put a valve where I can just shut the hot water off when that shower has been running too long with my, with my son. When he was growing up, we lived in one of those houses where if you turn the water on anywhere else, the shower water got ice cold. This house unfortunately doesn't have that problem. So I don't have that solution. I found nothing will motivate somebody to get done with a shower, like the hot water running out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair. Fun. Do y'all have one of like, the ones I don't know if you've seen the one that I recommend. It's kind of like a camping one. Is that what y'all are using right now? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's exactly the one that you recommend, but it was designed for camping. Okay, it's okay. like the so easy tankless or whatever it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those work great. We use them for uh, 
I don't use them. I have a house. We use them for our guests at our workshop. We set up two <laughs> shower tents and we use two of those with just grill tanks. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it, there's 70 people here and it's in that environment. Not everybody's taking a shower every day, but one tank and those things get through um, uh, four days of 70 people using them as camp showers. They're pretty bad. Oh. Off. They're, they're very efficient. When we first hooked it up, we didn't plumb it into, we have, what is those big torpedo tanks? Like the 500 gallon ones. Yeah. 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 So we have one of those set up for our gas stove, our water heater and a propane heater for when you don't want to run the wood stove overnight. But when we first hooked up the hot water heater, it was a 20 pounder. And I think it lasted close to three weeks before oh, wow. we had to actually change out the 20 pounder. Yeah. That's not bad at all. That's they're no. they're not as cheap as they used to be to fill, but they're you know, you don't have to mortgage a kidney to fill a grill tank. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so that's 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 pretty good. Um at times you you get into a place where things suck, stuff breaks, everything you thought was gonna work doesn't. And you know, we had a term in the military embrace the suck. Have you guys had some experience with embracing the suck other than walking back from the, the, the busted <laughs> truck in the uh, cold showers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There have been a few different times. Um, I said, you got any good Ladies first. Um, <laughs> there were definitely times where, like, it is freezing. We have three dogs. So I don't know if we mentioned our shed is 12 by 18 feet. Okay. So it is one room for the two of us and our three dogs. Because we're and, morons. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there were sometimes this winter where, you know, like the dogs are going crazy cause they don't want to be inside. Like they don't want to be inside. They want to go run around. They want to yeah. be outside, but at the same time, it's too cold from outside. So they're there for five minutes. And there were definitely a few times where, you know, you had to kind of sit and remember like, all right, why did we bother doing this? Why was all, did all this feel necessary? You know, thing, there were definitely a few times where you know, just, it's hard. A lot of people, especially if you go online, like to really glamorize it. Yeah. And while there's a lot of great things, I would not trade how we're living for anything. Heart hands. And, yeah. You know, and everybody's always, you ever notice everybody in a tiny house reads books? It's like the yeah. only band, every Instagram picture when they're in their tiny house, they're reading their book and they're too cool to look at the camera while they read their book. And like, there's trade-offs. It looks great. And there's a lot of great things about it, but at the same time, it's difficult. Things break. And usually if one thing breaks, five other things break too. Every time. So, you know. I, I never have one thing break. No, fact, never. If something breaks, especially if it's not like a critical thing, I'm like, all right, what, who's next? Like, what's the bigger one? What's the more expensive one? What's the more painful one? Like, and it used, I don't know about y'all, it just seems to me like it comes in threes. Okay. It's like yeah. X and Y and Z. And Z's always the, we're the one where you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat the shit out of somebody. Somebody that doesn't even deserve it. I'm gonna randomly pick a person and take my frustration. Like, of course you don't, but that's like how you feel. Like, why? Why this thing on top of this thing and now this other thing? Yeah. So that, that's why uh, I, I can actually my priorities. my priorities are will something die, right? Yep. Will something eventually die? Will it get worse? Like that's the order I go in. If something's gonna die, I fix that first. Something will eventually die if this is a thing that will get worse if I don't fix it. And that's because you have to have some way to go. Okay, all three things I can't do all three at once. How do I decide yeah. what do I do? Yeah. No, that's fair. I honestly can't come up with any good examples of things breaking off the top of my head, so I'm sorry for that. No. <laughs> Plenty have, though. <laughs> yeah. That just means you're used to things breaking. Yeah. Right? Like If you look around, like, what never broke? Oh, nothing, right? <laughs> that's, that's how it starts <laughs> to feel sometimes. Um, but then you get good at fixing it. What I, that's another thing I've noticed. Like, yes, that happens. Yes, it's frustrating. But at the same time, you get to a point where something goes wrong. You, you, you may not be happy, but you know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. We do it nice because we do it twice. <laughs> you you uh, must have a friend here that's heckling you, this Tom feller. We don't yes. talk about Susie's hate crime, but on Juneteenth. The, you know who this is? Is, is this a legitimate, like, fun 
heckle or yeah like this is an old friend who is heckling yeah yes yeah i'm sorry about that it's one of my old Friendly co-workers heckling. yes he's all right yeah all right. just, just keep an eye on him because if it's not i'll throw his ass right out i don't mind i'll put it's, his ass see, out. see how he is but all he's right. all right for a little bit <laughs> um so yeah all right so um what kinds of designs and features have worked well for you guys? I mean, we've kind of, you know, beat up on the the stuff that goes wrong, but like you, you've had to have learned some things that are working well, or you, you know, you wouldn't be here together right now. You'd be yelling at each other. As simple as possible. Yeah. Basically doing things as simple as possible. Okay. And you know, the more parts and pieces you put into something, the more things have the chance of breaking. And we also, so we're planning to build a house that is slightly bigger than, you know, 12 by 18. And one of the things that we're choosing for the design for that is using ICF concrete. So like the foam concrete forms um, to build the entire house from, you know, foundation to the roof. I mean, the roof will be like traditional and all of that. But, you know, with a concrete building, it traps heat really well. It's well, you know, it's the putting, building it itself isn't cheaper concrete lasts a lot longer than wood does yes so you know when we're trying to build something that's going to both last and also be really energy efficient that has worked well um our solar panels are not on the roof of our house they're actually on freestanding platforms which are low enough to the ground that we can use a like basically a long snow brush to clear the snow off of them because you know people put them on their houses their way up Especially yeah. around here, we get so much snow for half the year that, like, they're not going to do anything. So that's why we keep them, you know, we built them so way we could clear them. And, yeah. Yeah. Not to mention a big thing about off-grid and why a cold climate is great because your needs are really simple. Like, it's a wood stove. You put yeah. wood in it, you yes. get heat. Yes. Yeah, like People you don't have to have power. Grid, I'm like, because we have five months in a row where the sun tries to kill me. Yeah, That's exactly. Bad, right? like, That's kind of to kill you. It's not. It's not hot out. The sun's like, I'm gonna kill you. You're like <laughs> the ant when you were a kid with the magnifying glass. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like running from shade to shade so you don't burst <laughs> into flames. Like, yeah, I've always said that the cooler climates are easier for off grid because we can make heat really easy in off grid. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, especially you but said you guys have like over thirty acres. There's probably enough fallen timber and stuff that needs to be taken out to heat your place for years without worrying about like over without even cutting a live tree. Yeah, we wouldn't even need to cut a live. We won't need to cut any live trees for years. Between that and we also, you know, we have propane for backup, sure. but for the most part, we use the wood stove. And I'm. I can't, I can't remember for the life of me where we originally heard it, but nine meters by nine meters being like the ideal space for a, to heat with a wood stove. 30 by 30 in freedom. Yeah. Minutes. So we were planning to do 30, 30. Originally our plan before we even heard that was 30 by 30 with the primary heating source being a wood stove. And it just happened to work out that, you know, that's an ideal size space. See, this is all that happens when you spend your your good, hard-earned money, folks, to send your kids off to college. They come home brainwashed and use the metric system. That, that's that's <laughs> Thank what you, you Jack. get, right? Twenty-five grand a year, you get the metric system. <laughs> I, I pick on metric system stuff, but it there's there's validity to being able to divide by ten in your head. I, I will give listen. You that. So I we, still we don't, don't know what a anyone. kilometer is in my brain, though. That when somebody says yeah. four <laughs> kilometers, I I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Kami. <laughs> Gas is X dollars a liter. I well, shut up. <laughs> Maybe gallons. Yeah, yeah I want I, it to be an arbitrary measurement. Yeah, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, really. But honest to God, the only thing that prevents us from from joining the rest of the world in meters and centimeters and liters is we all in our mind have an understanding of what these things mean. And oh, yeah. yeah. Gain things. So if somebody says something's like two and a half miles, you're like, oh, I got that. That's a, yeah. that's a 30-06 rifle shot. I, I got you, bro. I you know, I understand <laughs> what you're talking about. You know, when somebody's like, it's it's four kilometers. <laughs> Or three hectares. Shut up. Just say six acres. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Yep. It, and then Kelly says, this is totally nothing to do with what we're talking about. I think it's funny. 
The UK leaders aren't even the same as normal leaders. Now I'm out. That's it. I'm done. All right. <laughs> nope, we're on done. It, I'm out. No more meters and leaders. Um, All right. but, but okay, you said you're going to make a bigger house. How much yep. bigger? Because I think you said your 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 shed conversion cabin is 12 by 18. Yep. Uh, and I looked right out this way when you said that. And there's a reason. There is a 12 by 18 tough shed with a loft in it that I used to store stuff right there. And I looked at that and thought. <laughs> They have three dogs and I have three dogs. No, I'm not living in there. So, <laughs> <They're> in <crates. laughs> you know, sometimes you feel like a house is too big, but I, I kind of yeah. look at when you're building small homes, you look at it like buying a boat. Nobody ever says, I wish the boat was smaller. Right. Except yeah. When you're towing it and you don't tow a house. So <laughs> how big are y'all thinking? Are you thinking like going to like a two bedroom, one bedroom with a stuff like, what kind of size are you thinking? So the plan is going to be 30 by 30. There's going to, with a basement and one floor above ground and okay. like fully do out the basement to be like finished, you know, completely finish the basement. Um, that's so then kind of, foot under roof. That's, that's good. Yep. Yeah. With so that's floors. with both floors. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of the plan, you know, throw our master bedroom down in the basement, couple bedrooms, main floor. So. <laughs> Builder says that metric is the stupidest and most unscientific measurement we've come up with. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, and you guys are going to do this with the, uh, the insulated panels, the co insulated concrete form. Is that what you yep. said you're going to do that? Oh, okay, cool. Um, when you move out and I've noticed this, like I have neighbors even, and they say good fences make good neighbors. And I think there's some truth to that, but you do give up some of the easy community. Like when we yeah. live in a neighborhood, you can just walk around and meet people, you know, and, yeah. and here like everybody's perimeter fence, which is great. Cause everybody has dogs and animals and all, uh, we don't have porch pirates like you know, the people down the road do. Um, but finding community can be a little harder. Have y'all found that to be the case? And have you done anything to adapt to it? A little bit. Actually, I wound up, you know, because like we said before, he goes and he still works nine to five and I stay home. So, you know, we kind of hit a point where I'm realizing that, like, I talk to dogs a lot more than I talk to humans. And, you know, that <laughs> that's not exactly healthy. So I wound up going, you know, I started going to church more. And one of the things that I realized was, you know, you got to talk about what you're doing. And a lot of people tend, you know, a lot of people think start to think it's really cool. And you would never know how many people are actually interested or want to do the homesteading off grid thing, you know, unless you go and talk to people. And a lot of people I've also noticed, even if they're not super interested, they're like, and eh, that's not the life for me. They want their kids to see it and they want their kids to be exposed to people, you know, raising their own food, living a different way. And so a lot of it is just, you know, like I said, for me, church was how I made that happen. But, you know, being willing to go and talk about the things you're doing as, you know, we live a kind of crazy life, but um, a lot of people think it's really cool and want to come see it. Yeah, I, I've noticed that just with our customers, like for our duck egg business and what have you, you know, you got this person there driving 30 miles to get a couple dozen duck eggs and they live in the suburbs down in Arlington or something. And but you get out here and they start telling you about all kinds of stuff that they saw on the Internet. And you're like, well, do you want to go look at it? You know, they're telling you about <laughs> composting and the guy that was just here, he's telling me about composting and aquaponics and gardens. And I'm like, dude, let's just go around the house. Like, yeah. actually, you know, and it, it's amazing how much interest there is in this type of lifestyle right now. And I think it's because a lot of people are having the same kind of come to Jesus moment y'all did with it. it is, all of us will have different things that are the trigger. But I think there's a lot of people starting to say some things are not right. This is not how we're supposed to live. And there has to be a consequence to it eventually. And when the consequences come, I'd like to be out of the way, please. Right. I yes. want to be in a more defensible position because I keep hearing whenever I tell people I get out of the cities and all, there's always somebody that chirps up, stay where you are and fight before they take over everything. And you know, that person never lives like in Portland or Seattle or New York City. You know, that yeah. person sitting on a farm in Kansas 
telling somebody in New York City to stay there. On some <laughs> levels, I can understand that. But I do feel like we're running out of time where doing this is going to be relatively easy. And I think it still is. But if you guys were listening to me for a while now, you know that like three years ago, I was screaming, get out, get out, get out. And I'm like, it is not going to get any easier. And it hasn't. It is more difficult today to do what y'all have done than it was just three years ago. And then even oh, if, it stayed, if it stayed static, I think y'all would agree with this. The longer you don't do it, the harder it becomes for you. People think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get a promotion. I'll make more money. I'll do all these things. And then I'll be able to go live the life I want. But what ends up happening is you become more and more locked in to that life, oh, yeah. almost like it was designed that way. Like as income goes up, lifestyle quotient goes up, but the lifestyle quotient becomes these hooks that it's not just what I'll have to give up. Like a lot of it, you can't give up, right? You end up with certain things you have to pay for that you've already done and used up like expensive oh, yeah. cars and things like that. And you can't get out of it. All you do is roll it into the next you know, now I, the, the dude I just was talking to about buying a new car that he was like, well, we do loans out of 72 months. And I'm like, not with me. You don't on a car. What kind no. of crack pipe are you using, bro? Like, no, I'm not financing a freaking car for, for six years. Like, and now they're doing them at 84 months, seven years on oh, a man. car. It's like, it's not yeah. a cabin no. cruiser boat, dude. It's a car. Yeah, I financed the land just so we could use more of our savings to actually build. But sure. the land's going to be paid off in 10 years. That's see, that's yeah. I I'm not a big fan of paid for real estate out of pocket because I think you can do more with the capital than the cost yep. of capital loan, right? Like what you're saying like you can do I think right now our mortgages are I don't look because I don't have any plans to buy anytime soon, but I think they're in like the 6 to 7% range. And so if I pay for real estate out of pocket, what I'm saying is I can't do better than 7% on my money investing it in tools, my, my own property, other investments, my business, what have you. That's what Hard assets, I, you don't yeah. teach people to think that way, but that's what you're saying by your actions. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is nice not to have a mortgage. I get it. But it's also nice to have money to do things with, like, because I think yep. you guys are probably finding that a lot of things you think, oh, that'll be 400 bucks. And by the time you actually sit down and do an estimate on it, it's like 650. And your yep. number was probably good three years ago. You know, because yeah. I, yeah. I, I found myself now, like, I'll look at a project and go 350 bucks. And I'm usually within 5%. I mean, that used to be part of my job to estimate projects. And then now I price and go, what the hell happened? You know, how much is a PVC fitting? Like, you know, like, what, yeah. what is going on here? Like, you have to have the Biden factor now, I guess. The, yeah. The Biden inflation factor. I think you're absolutely right. And then you'll get people who are like, oh, yeah, you know, the problem is just because Biden's in office. It's like, no, no, he's a big no. factor. I'll give you that. But, like, yeah. all of them are crooked. Yeah. Like, yeah. How about building your life so it's not dependent on who's in office? Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly where we're at now because let's say it was all Biden's fault. It's not. Yeah. Let's say that it was, yeah. right? So the orange pumpkin man rises again, comes back, <laughs> and takes over, and does his best. Levels yeah. inflation to what ain't going to happen, 0% for the next four years. And everybody yeah. cheers about it. We're still stuck with everything that happened, right? Yeah, yeah. it doesn't go away. A cumulative effect. We've been doing this... <clears throat> Since people say 1913, but we've really been doing it in the current stupid, like hypersonic, super, super stupid mode since 1971. And there's yep. a point now we're getting to where we've danced a long time and the fiddler's got his hand out and he wants to get paid. Yeah. And Everyone's betting on inflation. Money. Yeah. 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 Everything will just keep going up. Wants either like sacrifice of lifestyle is what's coming. Yeah. yeah. So. In the interest of that, if you're willing to make yourself uncomfortable and build some good things now while things are still up and running, whether things go bad or not, I've heard you say this before, yeah. like, what's, what's my downside? I live on 30 acres off in the woods and hang out with my dogs when I get home from work. Like, the people there's no downside. The people tell you you sacrifice too much or whatever, they don't understand it, would, would turn around and go out and rent an Airbnb 
and pay oh, $400 yeah. a night to stay in a place just like you've built for yourself. Pretty much. I'm said this was the last vacation we took was the summer before we moved up. We took a vacation here, stayed in his uncle's hunting cabin that wasn't too, you know, it's pretty similar to uh, how, we started. how we started. And then, you know, the next year is like, all right, well, instead of going on a vacation here, let's live here. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. What are the biggest learn lessons you guys have learned? Um, so yeah, I think one, it's so stupid. Uh, an old friend said this to me at one point and it just kind of sticks. It's just the phrase, I can do hard things yeah. where like, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you know, hiking uphill at, you know, just back to that, you know, midnight in the snow. And, you know, you just kind of hit a point where you're at the end of what you think you can physically do. You're at the end of, you know, what you think you can handle. And just learning that, no, you can actually do a lot more than you think you're capable of. Because I've said quite a few times, like if somebody showed me like back in May, what our life would have looked like from, you know, July through now, uh, I, I don't, wouldn't have, I might not have gone through with it. Cause it's like, I don't know if I can handle that. Like, I think that's too much. I think a lot of, and I think it's true for a lot of people that you are capable and you can handle dealing with a lot more than you think you can. You're, you know, and People like to hold themselves back. Like, oh, I can't. I could never do that. Well, if that's your attitude, then probably not. But just learning that, like, no, you can do a lot more than you think you can. If someone out there was thinking about doing this, what would you tell them? Want me to? Uh, yeah, go for it. All right. So, <laughs> I, I would kind of. I don't necessarily agree. I, I think that's great for what she said for the answer for your last question. I think yeah. the biggest lesson I've learned, it's going to kind of feed into your question is okay. I know now more about what I don't know than I did before. And okay. I think that is the biggest thing going into it is like, you have to kind of acknowledge that I don't know everything I need to know to do this right now. And that's okay because I'm going to learn as I go. You know, as long as you are doing the things to make sure you are safe, you have your six needs that you've talked about before met. Like, as long as that's good, the rest you can figure out as you go. You know, so I think anyone who's interested in doing this, it's like, take stock of what you know how to do, what you know you can handle, and then be comfortable with just saying, Okay, I'm going to learn the rest as I go. I can handle this and I can do this. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I think it's very you know, hard to know what you don't know, right? That's that. Yeah. That's like you. It's one thing to know that you don't know everything you need to know, it's another thing to realize how many things you don't know that you don't even know are a thing. But yeah. I, I also agree that I, I don't think you're going to figure out what that is without jumping in the pool like yep. you can read all the books you want you can watch all the youtube videos that you want um including people who are very much not the heart hands perfect instagram people the people that show you the things that break the sh that show you the things that go wrong and all it still doesn't yeah. mean that you're gonna really understand because your situation is different when I was talking about not financing a truck long term, Erin popped up here in the live feed and she said our 72 month loan on our Ram was 2.9 percent. The land loan was going to be 7 percent. So we bought the land out of the life insurance policy and financed the truck. Now, there's a lot of people who say that's not real smart. Well, I would also say they don't know Aaron's life. Yeah, right? and, and, and like, like I can't that, comment on her. Yeah, everybody's situation is different. And yeah. when you start talking about building a off grid homestead, you could have somebody on the other side of the road, on the other side of the dirt road that bought the same tough shed or cabin you bought and, and is literally building the same way. And they're going to find different needs because they're different people oh, yeah. and in different situations that have a different solar exposure, even on our same climate. Now let's translate that out to y'all are up in upstate New York and I'm in central Texas. We are not going to have the same issues, no, no. matter yes. what. 
right? No matter how much we can learn from each other, and we can, we are yeah. not going to have the exact same issues. No, like I can dig a hole, for example, without hitting ledge. Sorry, Jack. No, yeah, yeah. You don't have a a, a, a concrete freaking parking lot under your house. You know? <laughs> the, the other side of that is I'm never going to call a, a foundation repair specialist. Yeah, my yeah. House yep. going Unless the tornado hits it, my house isn't going yep. anywhere, and y'all ain't going to have a tornado problem. No, I mean, like, snow is our main thing for tornadoes. You have to worry about building for, you know, blizzards. And, and that's, yep. that's my point that those are the macro things that we can think of off the cuff. But as you start actually putting pedal to the metal and making things happen, and you're putting a garden in, you could have a pest problem that the guy two miles away doesn't have. Like yeah. all of those things pop up. And, and we're just giving random examples because you really can't know until you try. And one of the nice things, too, is, you know, as much as there are a million problems with our, you know, modern digital age, there's also, you know, as much as everyone's going to have their own issues, somebody else has had the same problem that you're having. And if you look, you can find whatever resources that you need. You know, there's somebody online that has the answer to whatever question that you're trying to find, which me makes it, you know, while you're still going to have challenges and have issues, you know, there's the information out there to help you find it. So, you know, like, yeah, there are problems, but there are also solutions. And I think a lot of people just kind of get bogged down by, oh, I don't know enough to do this. And well, you can still find that out. Yeah, yeah. Have y'all guys done anything? Go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. I was just gonna say, yeah, that's the big thing about doing something now rather than later. You hear a lot, especially in like the community of preppers, of like, oh, I'll do this when things get bad. It's like, listen, I'll tell you, it's a pain in the ass doing it now while times are good. I would love to see you try and do what we're doing once things get bad. Like, it, it's a big thing that you talk about, building a better life if times get tough or if they don't. Yep. We're doing it now, and it's a lot not easier, but it is simpler now. It's definitely not easy, but it is simple. I, I feel like I'm in better physical shape than when I moved into this place about 11 years ago now. But I also, even in being, you know, I was overweight then and not as good of shape for the age that I am now. But some of the work that I did when we first moved in, I don't even know that I want to think about doing that in my 50s. And I, I know I'm not going to feel that way in my 60s. So I think another impetus to go ahead and get out and do it is a lot of the physical labor that needs to be done is best done when you're young. When, when I was 25 years old, I, some nights I'd work till three o'clock in the morning, get up at six 30 and go back to work. Like it was no big deal. But now I'm in bed at nine o'clock reading a star Trek book. I mean, you know, like aging is part of this decision too, I would think. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, you know, we moved into our rundown kind of junky camper and, you know, like I'm 21. So it's not that, you know, it doesn't bother me as much sleeping on like a kind of like a pretty terrible mattress and, you know, sleeping rough and all these things at 21. It's going to bother me a lot less than if I was 20 or even 30 years older. And I know a lot of young people troll because they're like, oh, I don't have enough money. Well, land isn't nearly as expensive as, you know, buying a house. And you can buy a rundown camper for pretty cheap. And not that I'm suggesting rundown campers are like the best thing ever, but like you can get something that'll work long enough for you well, for you not it. too expensive. And, you know, there are ways to get go about this without it being crazy expensive. I, I saw a thing yesterday. I wish I would have saved it or shared it so I could find it again. But it was a screenshot of somebody that had tweeted or Xed or whatever the hell they call it now. Uh, from Sweden that was just like window shopping our real estate. And they weren't looking at raw land. They were looking at more like old, worn out, jacked up country houses that were sitting on a few acres. And they were like, in America, you can buy a house that could be made warm and safe uh, with a significant piece of land for one year's wages. Yeah, I saw that. Right? Yeah, did you see, see what I'm talking about? And I was thinking, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity out there too, like these older homesteads and stuff. Like um, Nicole Sauce, when she bought her place, it was not in great shape, but there was a building there already, and there was a and it was something to work with. And she got it really for a song. And when you look at it today, and she tells you what she paid for it, you can't believe it. But it didn't look like that when she got it. 
Yeah. You know, and I we think there's relate. a lot of opportunity, whether they're, you're going to do what, what y'all did and buy raw land and develop it, or to find like older homesteads that aren't aren't really in demand right now. And I know some people are like, well, that's not the case where I live. Well, maybe you need to live somewhere else. Y'all didn't move across the street. Y'all made a significant move because that's where the opportunity was for you. I think we have to get a little bit of that pioneer spirit that this country was built on back to where if this place doesn't work for me, then I'm going to find a place that does. Right. Yeah. And you've talked about it before about, you know, um even if the you know like the you don't know what it's like to be from here and moving somewhere else to just kind of change your mindset in that way too because i'm sure back in you know we could have found something workable back where we were but that complete change it really affects your mindset too to where you know you don't feel limited by the area that you're in or the people that you're around yeah. So I think, you know, there's a lot that helps mentally too with moving and, you know, wherever you find the, you know, opportunity. Yeah. I, I will say this though. We definitely weren't going to find 32 acres That's for 40,000 yeah. <laughs> in Connecticut because no yeah. one wants to move to New York that wants to think like us. Yeah. Yeah. There, New York's a great ge geographically. Like yeah. I, I spent a lot of time when I was a young kid like up in the Adirondacks area. Yep. And then a lot of time it was actually Pennsylvania, but like right on the border, like Cameron, Potter County, that was like places I used to go hunting. And it, as long as you stay away from New York city and like Albany and like the whole Schenectady upstate thing, like away yeah. from the yuppies, um, they might have stupid laws, but laws only matter when someone's there to enforce them. And I found that when you live kind of out in the sticks, no matter where you live, there just isn't time and resources to come bother somebody. Like, oh, yeah. We don't act. Almost all the harassment you hear is something like a water rights thing that involves a federal agency. You almost never, or some sort of weird targeting thing like happened to Mark Baker uh, over yeah. the pig thing that happened a few years. It, it's, it's generally a homesteader living out in the sticks. They're left alone because people don't want to drive down roads where they're afraid they're going to hear banjo music. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, when we lived fair. in Arkansas, that was the like almost, I would say, 90% of people that came to our place when they got there. That was the first thing out of their mouth. I, I don't know. And it was just two miles of dirt, is all it was that was dirt. But, that, but it was just it's all it is for us. You know, Paul Harvey used to say there's less trouble at the end of a dirt road. You pulled off onto that dirt and it was like, uh oh, this is a different kind of place. Leave these people alone. And I think that is a true thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're talking about Boomer. Yeah. So we're about two and a half miles from the nearest paved road. And then, you know, from the public roads, about three quarters of a mile. And it's just, it's far enough back that, you know, you have to be lost to find our place. Yep. And even if you yep. do, one of our dogs is running around with a two by four in his mouth. So, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, one of the best no trespassing signs I ever saw in my life. It said, "You're not lost. You're trespassing." And it yep. was on this gate at a place that I and I was I was booked to hunt this place. It was a private hunting uh, uh, ranch, and it made me a little nervous. And I was supposed <laughs> to be there, right? Like, like I don't know about this. It's gone, bro. Like it's over. Uh, or my yeah. neighbor in Arkansas, up around the backside, he just had this piece of plywood. And he like spray painted it and said, stay out or else. And it just looks so bubba. And he was like, <laughs> this guy would have been like, or else we'll hug you. I mean, that's how nice this guy was. But yeah. when you read that sign and you didn't know that dude, like your stomach just sunk a little bit. And I think we, we kind of want to move into those types of positions where people feel that way because then the people you invite feel welcome and everybody else doesn't. And, and yep. Uh, you know, I have a comment here. I want to start going through some of the comments and questions. Of course. Um, but I think this is kind of hitting on that. Builder says, when shit hits the fan, you will not be able to move out in the country because the country people will be on their guard from intruders. And you need to start your community now. And, like, I think that's a true. Like, the worst things get is somebody moves in, even if they legitimately move in, you're kind of, like, that's already a thing. Uh, yeah. you know, oh, you guys yeah. are at least New York, not so much. You go down south where y'all are, like West Virginia, Western Carolinas, and all Appalachia. You, your great grandchildren might be considered locals, 
right? You will always be an outsider. And that will only become more the case as things become tighter. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, do you guys have anything going on so far with like gardens and stuff like that? Or are you just focused on infrastructure right now? Because I can understand if you are. No, actually, we have chick uh egg laying chickens right now i have dairy goats that are actually going to be giving birth any day now and okay. we have some rabbits growing so um i'm going to be starting a garden pretty soon but like you know we have a couple inches of snow on the ground and it's still yeah. falling so gardening is going to probably be a couple months out but no we've been mostly starting with you know animal production and which you know homesteading works really well for eating keto because it's mostly protein and produce which are yep. what you can grow yep Yep. I'm actually going to do a show about that pretty soon, talking about how if you're starting out, I think people have a tendency to think, well, I'll start with a garden. Well, gardens are slow and they're work and they have a huge learning curve. Yeah. You, If you have a functional IQ over 75, you mm -hmm. can figure out how to take care of six land hens. Yeah. I mean, real, and it's a six month ROI if you get chicks. To that first yep. egg. That, that first egg costs about a thousand dollars and they're practically free after that first day, you know, yeah. and yeah. if you talk about goats, you've got meat, you've got dairy, but you got to, the, uh, the only thing you have to do in that scenario. And I really advise people to do it is make sure that the necessary, at least not even just the nice to have, but at least the necessary infrastructure precedes the animal. Because yes. I've had more than one person tell me, so I thought I was going to be ready for chicken. So I went by tractor supply and they had chick days and I got 19 chickens and I let the kids pick them out. And it was great. Now they're flying out of the bin and I don't have a coop. And what do I do? And I'm like, dude, you need a coop. There's no other answer. Like you need some place for these birds to live. And, uh, but the other side of it is easier Then the other side of that is also, so you want to garden. So you need compost, you need waste product, you need processing of waste. Animals do all that, right? Like yep. you need this area cleared, throw some freaking netting up and let the goats graze it to shit further than you normally would. And there's your garden and then put the chickens on it and let them tear up what's left. And there's your garden oh, yeah. spot instead of you're out there busting your hump with, with a, with a mattock, right? Like there are ways to leverage the animals activities. Or I remember Sepp Holzer, when I went to a thing in Montana where he was teaching and some lady said she didn't want pigs when he was talking about how he manages there between his hoogles with pigs. And he said, you don't have to have pigs, but if you don't have pigs, you got to do the pig's job. And I think yeah. Yeah. Make those animals work for us in a way that makes them happy. Like chickens are happy to scratch stuff up. They, they, they're, they're fine. Uh -huh. so I, I, I was thinking y'all were probably gonna say we did the garden first. I'm glad you didn't. Cause I think the way you went is probably a good way to go. Well, the chickens came up with from Connecticut with us. Oh, yeah. okay. You already so have that them. helps too. Yeah. Chickens are the gateway drug. They are, man. I, I'd have um, to really like a chicken to take a chicken on a move, man. I, it, it, you know, yeah, chickens I, are replaceable, man. I don't. <laughs> I had an empty truck bed, so we figured we'd okay. throw what we had in there. How many Fresh eggs do you have? Right now, we have like 11. When I loaded up the truck in Connecticut, I had, I think, 25. By the time I got to New York, I had about 14 that were okay. still uh, able to run around. Okay. And since then, we've lost a few. Actually, none to predators, which is amazing seeing, you know. All to yeah. old age. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, they're, they're chickens. They're not parrots. They don't live forever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to actually jump on what you said for a minute about the, you know, getting everything there for your animals before. So uh, she, she's going to hate me for this one, but uh, <laughs> sh there's a very clear rule in our household of she can get whatever animal she wants okay. as long as it is productive and the infrastructure is there first. And I think I stole that one from you, if I'm being honest. Yeah. But um, we were talking about something or the other and this was right before she got meat rabbits. I'm like, yeah, get the cages for it. Figure out what you're going to do. And if everything's here, yeah, go for it. Sure. And, sure. and now uh, I was actually, before we came to chat with you today, helping a friend of mine build a 10 by 10 shed that we're going to just set up inside for rabbits. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah. she's going to have a pretty big rabbit operation. 
that would be the case too. Like y'all do need extra protection for them because they can't handle yeah. that kind of cold, especially if they drop kits in your yeah. litter. I mean, they're just gonna freak little rabbit sickles immediately. You must yeah. be dogs. <laughs> Frozen rabbit nuggets. Yeah, not good. Um no. Builder of Castle says, question, is it like starting a business? You'll never have enough money or enough preparation. So where is the point where you can just jump and make it safely? I definitely agree with that statement. Yeah, and I think, a question. but yeah, I mean, I think he mentioned it earlier was, you know, make sure you can meet your six, you know, survival needs and make sure you have backups for all, you know, make sure you have everything that you need to not die and just kind of like figure it out from there. Um, that, I mean, that's what all, all I got for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can definitely speak to that one because my original plan was, Oh, I'm going to stay at my job for a few years, save up. And like, then we do this and you start kind of running the numbers versus, you know, stay at your job, what you can save up, you know, paying the mortgage for the roof over your head now versus when we go take this plunge, as you put it, like, it doesn't make sense logistically to sit here and be miserable just to save up to give ourselves maybe a little better chance versus just going for it and start now. So I think that'd be the best way to answer that question for yeah. Builder of no, Castles. I also think that there's there is a point where you think you're saving, but you're never going to save that much because you also have a high burn rate. And it kind of yeah. feels like you're shoveling ice and you're shoveling ice in a 75 degree room. And a yep. certain amount of that ice, as you keep working, the pile is only going to get so high because it keeps melting. And so yeah. when you have a modern lifestyle sucking your income, oh, yeah. then, then, then you think, well, I have to go make what I'm making now where we go and make the same to get ahead where, well, it's not, it's, it's back to the thing I say about taxes. It also has to do with other expenditures. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. I know yeah. people that make a quarter million dollars a year and they don't have, they don't have anything. I mean, they have a nice I'm, house and a nice car, but if they lost their job in two months, they would be moving into a box somewhere. Yeah. I'm actually really glad you said that because now, since we moved, I have no problem discussing it. I made very good money before we left, well clear of six figures, and I gotcha. took a huge pay cut to do this. And yeah. I'm actually saving more now than I was able to before. And I can pay all of our bills if everything goes wrong. Don't get me wrong. I really like where I'm working. Uh, I work at a local building supply place, and yeah. it, it's a good job. Like I really enjoy what I do, but if something happened to the point where I couldn't work there anymore, I could go get a job at McDonald's for minimum wage tomorrow and still be able to afford everything we're doing and retire in 10 years when the homestead's producing and the land's paid off. That's wonderful. And then the job is a good place to work when you're building a homestead up. Like you're you telling me, sir. Coming in, you know, when it's on sale, you know, you have connections to suppliers you probably oh, have you, you to ordered... contractors who come by from you and you can, you yep. know, sometimes it's not even, well, they can come do work for you, whatever. Just having a network of people, you go, I'm trying to do the thing. Here's yep. the thing I'm trying to do. And they go, oh, I know how to do that thing. Take this thing and put it together. And it, having that kind of a Rolodex, like a, a living Rolodex is pretty oh, yeah. cool. And then you there's know? also part of that like you know part of the company works for they also have things like a feed mill and a hardware store and they oh, have yeah. a pretty nice employee discount so not only building supplies are discounted all of our animal feed it not only is the job itself nice there's some pretty good benefits i'm gonna say you get employee discount with that right so yeah cool oh yeah yeah, yeah. so not to mention all the uh, so we didn't do much clearing just enough to have like a little spot for a driveway put our cabin get everything kind of set up. We did just enough of a clearing for that. I want to leave as much of the 32 acres forested as I can. Mm -hmm. But so we didn't clear very much and get a whole lot of firewood. Uh, one of the nice things about where we live is there's a lot of logging. So we bought, I think it was for five cords, uh, about 260. So bought 10 cords in total for just over $500, which I think back in Connecticut would have gotten you maybe two cords of wood. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. 
So wood is a lot cheaper here, but I found that people don't actually season their firewood here. So we have everything kind of stacked and drying and we'll use it next year. But in the meantime, I get wood scraps from work and I've actually been heating our home. Yeah, we use the propane heater for overnight, but for I'd say 50% of our heat needs has been scrap pieces from my job. I love that. I love so that. like awesome. you don't necessarily have to be making a lot of money for your job to do something helpful for your homestead. Yeah. Um, Bonnie's asking about like your, your preparedness for medical emergencies. Um, she has oh, you a prepaid ambulance subscription, air ambulance, cause she's that far out or he's that far out. I'm sorry. A uh, hundred bucks a year versus 35,000 for one ride. Um, I don't know if y'all so, are that approach are that far out, but do y'all I mean, have any way that you handle? Because insurance, insurance kills us. Like it's my single. I we pay more for insurance for Dorothy and I than my freaking mortgage on my twenty five hundred square foot three acre property. You want right? this one? Like, I got this. So one nice thing, I mean, we are both EMTs and we have plenty of medical supplies stored. So for the two of us to hit a point where like we need to call someone for medical care is, you know, takes a while. And if you want to finish. Oh, yeah. And then so another benefit, I see what you're saying about like health insurance is expensive. It's what keeps a lot of people working. What we found in one of the benefits i guess quote unquote to a blue state is um you know they believe everyone should have free health insurance Ah. so right now by taking that pay cut i actually don't make enough so now i qualify for state insurance which isn't necessarily the best thing but if you're gonna mandate that i have it and i'm paying taxes anyways i'll take it yeah i i have no problem with it it's i guarantee you it's no worse than my insurance I get yeah. it. I almost never go to the doctor. My wife, I, I can tell you, it doesn't cover anything. We spend right. thousands and thousands, and it doesn't cover shit. Right? Yeah. Like, you, you know, you say you have a copay, but if you paid cash, it would have cost less. Or about the yep. only thing it actually does good on is cheap prescriptions, which are cheap anyway. Yeah. Right? I mean, like it doesn't do shit. It it's we, we've gotten to a place now. And I'm not attacking y'all, but the people that are paying really a low amount for insurance is because people that are paying a lot are paying for theirs. That, oh, that's yeah. how that's worked out. They screwed it up. It, it ain't oh, nobody's absolutely. fault. And if I could qualify for free insurance or cheap insurance or Obamacare, I, that's what I would have. Yeah. You know? Like, no argument here. I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Um, and then for any of the big emergencies, like she said, we're both EMTs. The nearest hospital is about half an hour. I'm actually still volunteering at our local ambulance company. I think that's valuable to do. Yeah, I really enjoy it. It's, you know, a way to feel connected with what I was doing before. You know, something you can feel good about and keep the skills sharp. Yeah, yeah. All right, your heckler, Tom, here says, I have loaded bullshit, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I can't really see that picture of him there, but it makes me think of Kevin from Shark Tank. I don't like that guy. So, Tom, you're on my nerve here, bro. Uh, I, have, I have an unruly rooster. How does Ryan suggest I handle him? I'm I'm sure there's some background bullshit in this, but go ahead. Oh, you're fine. Uh, tell him chicken stew is the best way to go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I have that rule. If I get spurred by a rooster, unless he's there for a very specific reason, that happens once. Uh, yep. I had a young rooster spurred me in the calf and I think it was a five minute walk to the oak tree in the rope. I mean, like, that. <laughs> like yeah. I, I, I just don't have time for it. You know, we let Billy Roy go our little Bantam rooster. We let him go for about two years of spurring people. Cause he just didn't have nothing. Like you, 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 know, you look down at his little roosters. They're just hammering and you're like, dude, you got to chill before you go in the pot. He actually went cause he wouldn't shut up. That thing must be yeah. 8,000 times a day. And like he'd get up like right in the window and scream in the window at you. So, all right, guys. Well, this was fun. Um, you Absolutely. guys do have a blog. Uh, it's at yes. uh, porkchopranch.com yes, is... slash blog. Yep. Yeah, I post on it, you know, just different things that we're doing, lessons that we've learned, you know, stuff like that. 
I'm gonna put I'll make sure that makes it into the show notes for people. Um, right down below the video, if you're watching the video version, uh, there's a link that if you click it right at this moment, if we're still live, it, it won't go anywhere because we're not done yet. But once we get uh, everything spun up over on the audio side, which is about 30 minutes after we sign off from the live, uh, that link will be there. And anything else that we've talked about today that has a resource will always be there. And that's any of the video podcasts y'all watch. But hey, man, thanks for coming and hanging out with us for about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate you guys. Take care and uh, let us know if you ever want to come on back and uh, update us on your progress. I'm sure we'd love to hear it. Sounds great. All right, folks. Well, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I did. I, I, like I said, I love hearing people's stories like that. I just want to real quick here at the end, remind you some ways you can help support the show and the work that we do and, you know, improve your own situation as well. Uh, the bioreactor compost course that I put together at the end of last year has been doing really well. Uh, sales have just continued to come in as people keep trying and we just keep getting Tons of great reviews on it. Tons of great feedback on it. And, you know, no negative feedback. We've had some questions and stuff, and I answer that. If you're taking the course, by the way, while you're taking that course, we have a module installed where you can take notes on the fly. And including you can use that note uh, plug-in to send me questions as the instructor. There's a thing that says notify instructor on there. Please don't tech that box, though, unless there's actually a question uh, for every note you take or whatever. And I have to go through and figure that out. Uh, but if you have any questions, that's the kind of interaction you get. It's not just a standalone, you know, pre-recorded thing. You do get interaction. You can ask questions and things like that. And if you just look at the screen, if you're on the video, you see the difference between really great potting soil on my compost. And I have put this together in a way that anybody can do it. I haven't had anybody tell me they don't think they can go uh, do it after the fact yet. I also post all my reviews of products that I use in my own life. Sometimes they're homesteading or lifestyle products. Sometimes they're just products that make your life better or really great deals. Um, the Soundcore Spirit X2 wireless earbuds by Anchor. And Anchor is my favorite value electronics brand uh, of all time. They're just fantastic, guys. Uh, they stand behind everything. These these earbuds uh, normally sell for about 70 bucks, and they're a good deal at that price. Uh, they are equivalent to stuff from like Beats or what have you that probably sell for a couple hundred bucks. They're, they're just that good. Uh, but they're all, I, I really think they're discontinuing them. They have them on a fire sale price for 38 bucks. There's still some in inventory and available, and I recommend that you check them out if you have a need for something like this. Uh, they're just a great product. And they have the ones, they're the ones that hook over the back of your ear. I don't know what's wrong with my ears. I've got something wrong with me. My ears are weird. Uh, I've tried a bunch of different earbuds. They all sound great, but then they fall out into like garden ponds or deep grass and get run over by a lawnmower or what have you. These don't do that. So I recommend you check them out. And also remember, if you become a member of the MSB, that's the Member Support Brigade, you get a ton of discounts. You get a ton of discounts. It pays for your membership and you support the show. And that is the primary way that we uh, we pay the bills around here. And so let me say with that, if you're not a member, think about becoming one. If you've expired as a member, think about renewing. Uh, and if you are or have been a member, thank you, because you've enabled my life to be what it is. And I really appreciate it. With that, I will catch you guys tomorrow with an expert council Q&A show for the week. And uh, then we will... Uh, Go from there to a Friday flashback, and we'll come back next week and do it all over again. And I promise we won't have one of those surprise rewinds on a Monday. I had to do some accounting work and get some things ready for Ira Ramon Sancia this Monday, so we missed Monday, so we're at the end of a short week. Take care, guys. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>